Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. The start of November means cotton harvest is getting underway in our state. The strippers and pickers are definitely out in the field in the southern parts of Oklahoma. For an update, here's our OSU Extension cotton specialist, Dr. Seth Bird. We had some decent rains through the summer and we really need to have some warm, fairly dry weather to, to get the crop optimally mature and that's kind of what we got. We had a, a pretty good September, very dry, fairly mild and sunny and we started seeing a lot of fields start to crack, have cracked bowls in them by the middle of the month and that was earlier than a lot of us expected. So then as we entered into October we started seeing some of the earlier planted fields that may have matured a little bit earlier in, in September and had a harvest aid application made. We started to see harvest happening so early to mid-October and it really ramped up in, in mid to late October. And so now that we're in early November, we're starting to see a, a lot of our irrigated has been harvested uh, across the state. And we're starting to get into some of that dry land crop. And that typically is the pattern. We typically go irrigated first. And then dry land usually is a little bit later maturing. It's, it's later planted and usually later maturing varieties. And, and so we're starting to get into some of the dry land harvest now. We've seen much more of an impact if we want to talk about what's really had a had a shift on the crop or, or impacted the crop on the, the start of the season. So we're really seeing the crop fruit higher up on the plant than it normally does. And so um, visually the crop looks good. We've heard a lot of people comment on the look of the crop, but once you get the leaves off or once you dig down in the canopy earlier in the season, you can see how that fruit load was really elevated. Uh, and that kind of plays into uh, the, the cool start of the season. So we didn't fruit as early. And so that's why I think a lot of our, our yield expectations this year are, I don't want to say that we're, we're worried, but we're not certainly seeing you know anything that's going to break a record. Now there's certainly some dry land cotton out there that has either had an issue with getting leaves off or maybe has yet to see a harvested application and what we see a lot of times with uh, cotton that may be immature and we have we have difficulty getting leaves to senesce naturally when we get a cold snap or a cool spell like this it will kind of kick start that plant's natural processes and it, it'll start that senescence process uh, on its own and so Sometimes a, a cold weather event, you know, some, a couple of cool nights in a row can actually help us because it'll kind of kick the plant into gear and, and start that natural process when we're talking about immature cotton. So yeah, the, the, the price is, is beneficial this year. You know, there's a lot of questions or, or talk about looking ahead to next year and what does that look like with the price like it is. So obviously it's going to be an attractive commodity to grow because the price is high, but like everything else, the input prices are high too. And so I, I don't think that as long as we're, you know, a dollar, dollar ten in that range, I don't think we're going to chase anybody away from cotton. Um, but I, I do think that it's going to cause us to potentially look at how we manage the crop and our inputs differently uh, because our input prices are going to be so high. So we still want to capitalize on the, on the market price, but it, it, we may have some questions on how do we manage the crop to still be profitable when our input costs now are so high as well. Um, but things can change quickly, uh, but that's, I think, what we're looking at right now. We are talking more about cotton harvest now with Gary Strickland, our Jackson County Extension Director and Regional Agronomist. Gary, why don't you just kind of give us an overview of how things are looking down in your part of the state? Well, and one of the things, Lyndall, that we talked about is how's harvest progressing down in that area. And this year we've actually progressed uh, really quick. If I talked about just about Jackson County, irrigated acres, we're probably 90 plus percent done uh, down there at that point. We've had pretty good harvest weather, very few interruptions in terms of rain and things like that. Uh, dry land acres are probably in that 85 to 90 percent range done. Now if we talk about the southwest region in there, it's probably just a little bit lower than that, but again, progressing really quickly uh, with the weather is there. And, there shouldn't be a problem, I, you know, looking right now that I think that we'd be, be done prior to Thanksgiving on that, unless weather changes on that, but we're progressing very quickly. That is very good news, especially compared to some of the years past when we've been down there to visit with you. Um, let's talk about yields. How are, how are those looking overall? 
You know, that's, I think we're going to have at least an average, maybe just slightly above average yields uh, this year. Uh, from what I've heard from producers, we've had a couple of four bales, which are the exceptional yields down there. But I'm hearing lots of 275 up to about three and a half bales per acre on that. So again, I think we're going to do a little above average down there. It's going to be a good crop though. That is very good news and I'm sure there's some added energy and optimism when you factor in the current prices as well. Oh, well, sure. Uh, you know, as a cotton farmer, you're definitely encouraged with the prices that are out there right now. And if you can get those yields up there where they're get looking at with those prices, that means their cost of ret their returns are going to be better for them. Now, normally we're out in the field with you in, in southwest Oklahoma, down in Jackson County, but today you're up in Stillwater, so we use this opportunity to visit with you. You're here with your colleagues around the state. Uh, kind of having some planning sessions, right? Your fellow ag educators? That's correct. We're meeting with our Ag and Natural Resources Department to have kind of a, a priority planning session for this coming year. What are the things, the priorities that are gonna drive us in our extension programming to try to meet the needs of our, our county clientele out there? So you bring, you all bring that information in from the counties and then all discuss it together and look at the kind of common issues? That's correct. And we'll have sections that we look at, like I'll pull one out, crop diversity which I'll be working with and we're going to look at what are the priority areas across the state for that and within regions and what do we want to try to address in terms of programming in those areas. Okay Gary great to see you. Um, hope you all have a great meeting and hope the rest of harvest goes well down there. It's a pleasure to be with you today Lyndall. Thanks for having me. Okay thanks Gary. Hi, Wesley here and welcome to the Mesonet Weather Report. We got a little taste of winter early this past week as temperatures were much cooler than expected for this time of year. The state spent a few days struggling to see highs get out of the 40s. This map was the highs for Wednesday as of mid-afternoon. The cold weather was pretty short-lived as it often is in the fall. High temperatures are expected to be back into the 70s and much warmer than normal by the weekend, as seen by these forecasted highs for Sunday. Next week should remain warm too, at least for fall standards, as shown by this forecast map. The oranges and reds show a strong likelihood of above normal temperatures. Rainfall this past week ranged from nothing in the Panhandle to several inches in the Northeast. The highest totals were in Ottawa, Delaware, and Adair counties. This has the state soil moisture maps looking pretty good in the east. The dark green color indicates a near 100% plant available water on this four inch map. Unfortunately, the drier parts of the state in the far west and especially in the panhandle remain dry. Next week's prospects in the west don't look too promising either as seen on this precipitation forecast map. Gary is up next showing some improvements in the east on the drought monitor. Thanks Wes, good morning everyone. Well another good rainfall as Wes showed you and we are starting to rack up the moisture for the fall. What's that done to the drought monitor map? Let's take a look. Well, we've definitely improved over across the eastern half of the state. Just a few areas of uh, moderate to severe drought scattered about, uh, especially up in the northeastern and north central part of the state, um, Pawnee and Osage County centered in that area, uh, a little bit down in the far southeast. And then, of course, we have the drier conditions out across western Oklahoma, some severe to uh, extreme drought up in uh, the far northwest and in the western panhandle. Well, here's the culprit for the improvements. We see lots of good rainfall across the eastern parts of the state. Not as much down in the far southeast and uh, south central parts of the state. And it does start to uh, diminish rapidly as we get to the western portions of Oklahoma, especially the southwestern parts of the state. Let's take a look at the departure from normal for the last 30 days. Well, again, we see those deficits deficits across the western half and south central Oklahoma and again in the far southeast. But we see the good amounts, uh, the good surplus amounts of moisture across the east central and northeastern parts of the state. It's not necessarily a wet time of the year, however, so how does that uh, rack up to uh, percent of normal for over the last 30 days? Again, across the eastern half of the state, we do see those uh, good surplus amounts uh, up above 200% of normal across uh, east central Oklahoma, above 150% of normal across much of the eastern half of the state. Then we get out across uh, western Oklahoma 
we get less than 50% of normal. A few areas scattered about with uh, surplus. Okay, the monthly drought outlook just released uh, from the Climate Prediction Center for November. Uh, they show no drought developing across the eastern third of the state, but drought development is likely across the western two-thirds. I'm pretty optimistic for the upcoming couple of months because I do see a good start over the last seven to 30 days. Uh, so if we just need a little bit more and start to stamp out a little bit more of that drought. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Well, it's hard to believe October came and went. And Daryl, what did the October Cattle on Feed Report show? You know that the October cattle on feed report confirmed that we are continuing to pull down these feedlot inventories. Uh, we, we've seen a, a year over year decline in feedlot inventories now for four months in a row. So in, in September, placements were down ab about 3%, 97% of last year, and marketings in September were also about 97% of one year ago. So did any of that information, were you able to glean to, to see why you know fed cattle markets were so slow to improvements? You know, this has been a, a frustrating year for fed cattle markets we've been trying to kind of play catch up all year and if you look at this report combined with the last several reports and look at the weight breakdowns i think that starts to give us some insight on why we've been so slow to get the you know get caught up a little bit um, you know we've had a number of things going on obviously we've we've bumped up against capacity constraints all year so it's been hard to pull cattle ahead at all Plus feedlots have uh, been facing higher feed costs and they've had an incentive to place heavier cattle. That means they move through the feedlots faster. And so we've had large placements of, of heavyweight cattle up until now. And so we just haven't quite been able to move ahead of those. So, you know, why has it been so hard to get feedlots current? Well, all of those things that we just talked about and, and so it, it's just, it takes time. Uh, you know, we're, we're moving forward. Um, uh, you know, the, the, this latest report does show that uh, placements of heavyweight cattle uh, dropped in, in September um, and placements of lightweight cattle were a relatively bigger part of it. What that means is that we are going to eventually turn the corner. I think it's taken about two to three months longer than we thought it would, uh, but we are going to get there sometime, I think, by December uh, on into the first part of next year, we should see a significantly different feedlot situation. So, you know, speaking of next year, what do you expect as we finish up 2021 for uh, fed cattle markets in general? Well, again, we've been looking for this turnaround, and so, you know, we still think that we will see a significant uh, change in fed cattle prices. I think the, the situation will, will start to favor, uh, you know, cattle feeders, uh, and we'll see uh, significantly stronger markets. We may not get much of it yet in the fourth quarter of this year, but certainly as we move into the first part of next year uh, and, and through next year, we look for significantly stronger fed cattle markets. Do you think that some of the livestock marketers are gonna be a little bit more bullish going into, because you think back to this time last year, you know, the really knee deep in the pandemic, we're starting to kind of come out of that a little bit, maybe a little more optimism. Um, do you think there's gonna be a little bit more optimism for cattle markets? I think there is, there's a lot of optimism really kind of built into the market certainly if you look at futures markets so demand has been good again we've had these sort of supply issues these bottlenecks if you will that we've had to work through but once we get past that uh, you know there's an awful lot of reason to be uh, reasonably optimistic we do expect beef production to actually decline next year so we're going to have some supply support for prices as well as uh, you know the the uh, demand and export picture continues very strong all righty thanks daryl dr daryl peel livestock marketing specialist here at oklahoma state university So as we enter into October and November, deer activity generally increases. And there's a couple reasons, but the primary one is that the rut is taking place. And this is the time of year when deer are breeding. And the bucks, the male deer, are actively chasing does and, and searching, and they'll often let their guard down and they become less wary. Uh, they'll cross roads, uh, you know, with reckless abandon and this is the time of year we really, really need to be careful when we're driving, particularly during the low light periods early and late in the day and at night. Um, and, and, you know, slow down, really watch the roadsides and just be aware that deer um, are probably on the road and coming across the road and they're not paying very much attention to you. So we need to be extra vigilant to try to prevent uh, hitting a deer, which can obviously end poorly for the deer, but 
causes a lot of vehicle accidents. And if, if a deer does enter the roadway when you're driving, by all means, don't swerve. Just slowly and steadily apply the brakes and try to you know, decrease your, your speed, but don't swerve out of your lane. You're liable to hit someone or go off the road. So just be extra vigilant. Uh, try to minimize driving during the night, during the fall, and, and also uh, you know, slow your speed down. We have an update now on trade and policy with our Ag Policy Specialist, Dr. Amy Hagerman. Amy, let's kind of start with some of the big news bubbling around right now. So right now the big news in terms of trade is two things. First is the Trade Promotion Authority expiring on July 1, this last summer. That's the authority that allows our trade representatives to go out and represent the United States for different kinds of bilateral and multilateral trade negotiations like the negotiations that have happened with China in the past, which is the second big piece of news. The phase one trade agreement with China began in January of 2020. It was only a two year agreement for how much product China was going to uh, buy from the United States within that window of time. Uh, so it's just where we're at in terms of that agreement expiring and what we can expect in the future in terms of those exports. So in, it, it's a good idea just to be aware that that is expiring and kind of what shifts may take place early next year? Yeah, we don't expect a lot of big shifts. The reason being that just the broader economic factors in the world are very much favorable for trade. The United States is continuing to expand and enjoy recovery uh, from the disruptions of 2020. A lot of other countries in the world are as well. And that increases the demand for U.S. goods, especially U.S. agricultural goods. We've seen very high levels of exports of products like cotton, dairy, soybeans, beef, pork and poultry. Uh, we've also seen some changes in how agricultural exports are defined, which also now includes distilled beverages like whiskey, which are actually in very high demand in the rest of the world. Let's talk about some of the other things that are on producers' minds right now as we look to, to wind down the year. Yeah, I think certainly thinking about prices, thinking about our safety net programs and what we can expect in the next year. ARC and PLC payments just came out for the 2020 crop year. But remember the 2021 crop year is based on the marketing year. So it won't end until well into 2022 for most of our crops. Uh, for example, May 31st for wheat is the end of the 2021 marketing year. So we won't know for sure what payments we'll be doing in those programs, but right now prices look very strong. And if those prices continue to hold at these higher levels, we probably won't expect to see much in terms of those safety net program payments for the 2021 crop year. These higher crop prices are certainly very welcome news, but they're kind of offset with this added challenge of higher fertilizer costs. Exactly. So whenever we're talking about profitability and taking into account the costs, our safety net programs are really revenue or price based. They don't really account for higher costs of production like what we're seeing with these very high fertilizer prices. So those are going to require other kinds of risk management, like looking forward and setting prices ahead in time or, or other kinds of management in terms of the, the application on fields versus uh, depending on safety net programs to manage right. that risk. And that's why those records and strategy always so important. Absolutely. All, Absolutely. Of, all of that planning. Yes. Well, thanks for the update, Amy, of course, and uh, we'll see you again in a few weeks. Good morning, Oklahoma. Welcome to Cow Calf Corner. This week, we're going to talk about body condition scoring cows. And this information is covered in great detail in chapter 20 of the newest edition of our beef cattle manual. But basically, body condition scoring cows is a, is a system we have in place where the scores themselves range from one to nine, where one indicates an extremely thin, emaciated cow, and a nine indicates a very fat, obese cow. Now, we assign body condition scores or we evaluate body condition scores. We always suggest doing it at weaning as we think about the normal production cycle of cows. Typically, 
They're going to be in as good a shape as they're ever in at the time they calve. And as they lactate, they're going to melt down and get thinner. And by the time we wean the calf, we anticipate they'll probably be about as thin as they should be through the normal production cycle. We're going to talk the next couple weeks about using body condition scores as a management tool and when the optimum times of the year if we need to add body condition actually happen. So when we evaluate body condition scores, we want to take a look at things that actually indicate body fat reserves on the cows. Now what I mean by that is we want to look beyond the depth of a cow, the length of a cow, the frame size, the hair coat, the pregnancy status, and we actually want to take a look at those things and, and the indicators on cows along their top, around their tail head, through their brisket and flank line of where they're going to deposit fat. Uh, typically, if we think about a body condition score 5 cow, right there in the middle of that scoring system, we say it's about a 7% of her weight that's going to change as we go from one body condition score to another. So for example, if we've got a body condition score 5 cow that weighs 1,200 pounds at weaning, if we want to take her to a body condition score 6, about 7% of that weight means we're going to take her to about 1,284 pounds. If we let her drop to a body condition score 4, we'd expect her to drop down to about 1,116 pounds. So why do we talk about body condition scores and why are they important? The biggest constraint we have to getting cows to calve and wean a calf every 12 months is that postpartum interval in which we've got to get them rebred in 80 to 85 days. We know that nutrition is highly correlated to reproductive efficiency and maternal performance. And so as we think about the stresses a cow goes through and what typically goes on at the point of developing a fetus, giving birth, the particularly in spring calving cows, some of the environmental stresses that we face in terms of times of the year when she's living in cold, wet weather, which drives up her energy needs and she's not going to be able to meet those just through what we're feeding. We've got to have some body fat reserves in cows to get them to breed back or just return to heat, have a fertile heat, and breed back within 80 to 85 days postpartum. In cow-calf operations, it's Reproductive efficiency and actual weaning a calf every year is as economically important a trait as what we deal with. And so, what is our target? What are we shooting for in terms of a body condition score? We'd like to see our mature cow herd somewhere between a five and a six at the point that they calve. Let's say a five and a half is optimum. So we know that that cow going through the stresses of calving, lactation, particularly environmental stresses, is going to be, have the body fat reserve she needs to breed back in a timely fashion. We'll continue to talk about this next week. I appreciate you joining us this week on SunUp TV. Another week and another rally in the crop markets. So, Kim, what's going on? Well, prices just keep going up. You, you look at uh, wheat. Let's go back to early July, $5.96. Now, in July, we had days that we had a 30 cent price increase. We had days with 30 cent price declines. But by August the 13th, we were at $7.17 on the cash price. Wallered around, up and down, mostly up. Uh, this, this week we got to $7.75 on the wheat. Corn, go back to uh, early August, say August the 13th, $5 cash corn, uh, it's up to $5.65. Soybeans, $11.30 in uh, August the 13th, up to $12. So we've had prices going up relatively well. And you look at cotton, September the 20th, we had 89 cent cotton, Early this week, we had a dollar and 16 cent cotton prices. So what do you think is driving that rally? Well, I think it's supply and demand and uncertainty. Uh, you look at supply and demand, that's reflected in your projected ending stocks. For wheat, the world, 10.2 billion bushels compared to 10.6 last year. The five-year average is 10.4, so slightly below average on world stocks. But U.S., 
The ending stocks projected for wheat, 580 million bushels, 845 last year, 10-year average, 1 billion tight stocks in the United States. Hard red winter wheat, 311 million bushels this year, 427 last year, 528. So tight wheat stocks. Corn, 11.9 this year. It's up from 11.4, but remember prices are going up and we have some big changes, but the five-year average is 12.7. So relatively tight corn stocks, 1.5 billion in the U.S. Uh, this year, 1.2 last year, 2 billion on the five-year average. You look at soybeans, world 3.8 billion, last year 3.6, average 3.7. So average beans, but beans has got to compete for land with corn this year because they're wanting to increase corn production and tight stocks. 320 million bushels in the United States, 256 last year, 486 for the average. So overall, relatively good demand and relatively tight stocks. You know, what about the uncertainty? Does that have anything to do with, you know, the supply issues that we're just pretty much having with everything? Well, I think if you say supply issues is related to transportation, yes, because you sell the wheat or you buy the wheat, it's hard to get the cargo. Your cargo prices, your transportation prices have more than doubled. Uh, you got the COVID situation with uncertainty with labor. So you get the, the uh, ship to the, to the port. Uh, it's hard to get the labor to get it loaded or unloaded. So you got those problems. Then you got China. Remember we had that swine, uh, swine flu there in, in China with problems, increased their herd. So it's uncertain how much they're gonna buy. And they've been buying a lot of beans, quite a bit of corn. Uh, there's concern about inflation. So what should producers do with this year's crop that's already in the bin? Well, I think it's time to sell it on, the, on this market. Staggered in, uh, you know, we're talking about 20 cent price moves up in one day or 20 cent down, maybe up to 30 cents. When you're in an uncertain market, uh, basically stay out of it unless you've got some commodity to sell. If you have commodity to sell and you've got favorable prices, pull that trigger on a little bit at a time and stagger it out over several month time period. Alrighty, thanks Kim. Kim Anderson, Grain Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. That'll do it for us this week. A reminder, you can see us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.